Thank you guys so much for sending in questions for the Thursday Q&A. Remember, guys, I do Q&As every Tuesday and Thursday on this channel. If you want your questions answered for next Tuesday's Q&A, description box down below with all the details on how you can do so. Also in the description box is my TNA video that I made yesterday, my wrestling commentary. Go check that out if you haven't already. All right, let's get started with the questions. Johnny Russo asks, It frustrates me that The Miz is not featured in the main eventer. Has there ever been anybody that you felt that way about? Oh, yeah, tons of guys. Like, Ryback, I, I'm frustrated to this day that he's not a main eventer. And I'm frustrated that he's stuck with that bum, Curtis Axel. That's just my personal opinion. I just get frustrated. Every time I see Ryback, it's just, like, so much potential wasted. Why? Why, WWE? Why did you waste this guy? Not only Ryback, it goes back to even guys like, you know, Mr. Kennedy back when he was in the WWE. Um, uh, MVP was another guy that I felt like, damn, after that United States title run, I thought this guy was going to get rocket ship, up, rocket ship up to the main event scene. Like, I really was excited for MVP in the main event scene, and it didn't really happen. Uh, Kofi Keynes is another guy that I wish was in the main event scene. And then when it comes down to, like, even earlier days, like Shelton Benjamin, I thought this motherfucker was going to be a main eventer one day. Turns out I was wrong. And another guy that really, really frustrated me, and, and one of my favorites from the Attitude Era that was actually like a lower card guy was Christian. I always liked Christian. I found Christian always entertaining. He was never really like my favorite of all time, but definitely like one of my dark horse favorites was always a Christian. Christian was always that little dark horse favorite. And at the time, in 2004 to 2005, I did not understand why Christian could not get at least like a, a two-month world title run. I wasn't asking Christian to have like a year-long title run or anything like that. I just didn't understand how come this dude could not get at least like two months with the world championship belt. I mean, the guy was like beating Jericho's at WrestleMania. He was like always in the main main type of match, always had main segments on big four shows. How come this guy cannot get, you know, a two-month world title reign? I mean, if JBL from the fucking APA, a fucking Bradshaw, can have like a 240-day reign, how come Christian could not have like a two-month reign? That was just stupid to me at the time. I'm glad that Christian did get his due like in 2011. But I'm talking about back in 04 and 05. And I was just so frustrated that Christian could never break that glass ceiling. And I was happy when he broke the glass ceiling in TNA. Johnny Russo also asked, What's up, Chase? Can I get your opinion, your thoughts on Awesome Troop back in 2011? I like the Awesome Troop tag team. That was definitely an interesting tag team. I definitely love their love, love their rap. You suck, you suck, and that's what's up. I really felt they did a good job. It's such a shame that they broke up that team because I really felt that team actually had a lot more mileage in the tank, and I felt it would have also benefited our truth more as a heel and Miz as a as a heel going forward. It was all just because apparently they had terrible buy rates at Survivor Series 2011. Oh, we can't blame John Cena because that's physically impossible for the WWE to do to blame John Cena. And of course, you're not going to put the blame on Dwayne The Rock Johnson. That's that's never going to fucking happen. So they had to blame it on someone, and they blamed it on Miz and our truth. And really, to be honest, our truth also got caught with the spice supplement. So that also hurt the Awesome Troop, but it was definitely an awesome tag team. They were doing some really legit stuff. Like, the ending to Hell in a Cell 2011, that was a legit ending. I really liked what they did there. So the Awesome Troop tag team definitely was a team that had a lot of potential that really never got to see, got to be sought out to. So that's just my opinion on that. Paul Marco Lones asked Q&A, which would you rather have come back to play for the Chargers this year? Um, Prime LaDainian Thomason or Prime Junior Seah and why? A prime junior sale because our defense sucks, man. The Chargers defense is not good. We've improved a little bit. And yes, LT would be nice to have in the backfield, but our backfield's already crowded. You know, Ryan Matthews did have a breakout season. Finally, this guy lives up to his potential. So hopefully Ryan Matthews can build off this really good season this year and, you know, have another successful season. You know, Danny Woodhead is back there. And also we added Donald Brown, who I like a lot. So Really, to be honest, the backfield, I think, is fine. As much as I love a prime LT, a prime junior sale will help our defense and make that defense into one of the most legit defenses in the league and would actually give us a chance to go far in the playoffs. So I would have to say a prime junior sale for sure. Red Wolf 316 asks, what if the Montreal screw job was to happen today? Oh, it would be a blessing in disguise for the WWE. The WWE needs something like the Montreal screw job to happen today. Because that the Montreal screw job is what literally set up to the attitude era. That was like the 
key setup to the Attitude Era. That's what made the Attitude Era go into full force because then Vince started to be a real person. Like, you know, they, they've tried in the past to imitate the Montreal screw job. Like, you know, they, they always mock the Montreal screw job by having some screwy finishes. I can remember, like, the Saturday Night's main event with Shane and Sean. Uh, I believe that, you know, they had the, the Rock uh, do that to Hogan in Montreal, I can't remember, at the No Way Out 2003 pay-per-view. So so in all honesty, they, they've tried to do stuff like that to mock the Montreal Screwjob, but if they had a legit Screwjob today, it would be the most craziest thing in the WWE. I actually thought they were going to do a legit Screwjob at Money in the Bank 2011 with CM Punk. That would have been fucking awesome, in my personal opinion, if they actually did a legit Screwjob like that. But then we figured out Punk re-signed the deal and... Yeah, it wasn't going to happen. But a screw job today in professional wrestling, especially with a WWE, would be a blessing in disguise because it, it would be the most craziest thing to ever happen in wrestling. So I I would I would actually like a screw job. I don't care who gets screwed out of it. That would just be awesome to me. Uh Red Wolf 316 also asked, What was your favorite year in TNA before 2010? In my opinion, it was 2005. Uh 05 was a good year, but I would have to go with 07. I always liked TNA 2007. Even though I don't agree with some of the results of the pay-per-views and the screwy finishes, I did always like 2007. Something about 2007 just felt right to me. I always felt they had a nice, deep, talented roster in 2007. The Goshi Man asked, what was your favorite year in the WWE? My personal favorite year in the WWE would have to be the year 2000. That would be my favorite year in the WWE for sure. Uh, just because, you know... Rock and Triple H, one of my favorite feuds of all time, going at it. You know, Stone Cold came back after getting run out over by the car. You know, it, it was just all these really, really good feuds going at the time. Fresh faces in the WWE coming in. You know, Kurt Angle winning the WWE Championship, is, and Kurt Angle is one of my favorites. So it, it was just a fun year for me to watch in the year 2000. Gochi Man also asked, what did you think of Shockmaster's debut back in WCW? <laughs> It's one of the funniest debuts of all time. Just Flair in the background. Oh, God. <laughs> That's like the most timeless wrestling clip. I don't care what year it is. We could be in the year 2050, and people will still talk about the Shockmaster. That is how timeless that debut is. That debut never gets old to watch. I at least watch the Shockmaster debut at least once in a blue moon. Like, once every year, I at least see the Shockmasters debut because it is just such an amazing debut because it's just like, the dude's supposed to be this menacing guy with a Stormtrooper helmet busting through the wall. He's supposed to look badass and he trips. <laughs> like, the explosions. <laughs> and then he trips and he has, like, the terrible voice and he's... Oh, God. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> it's really bad. But that clip, that debut is timeless. That will always be burnt into wrestling fans' minds and wrestlers' minds. To this day, I'm telling you, I guarantee you, by the year 2020, 2050, everyone's going to know who the Shockmaster is. Shockmaster, in my personal opinion, just for his hilarity, he should deserve a Hall of Fame spot. I know that sounds stupid to say, but just think about how timeless the Shockmaster is going to be, or at least some recognition for <laughs> the funniness that he has brought, you know, to us as wrestling fans. Joe Juicy asked, what did you think of Maven eliminating The Undertaker? I thought it was interesting, <laughs> mainly because they were really hot on Maven, and I don't know why. I didn't think Maven was really all that talented, yeah, especially because you had Brock Lesnar and Batista down in OVW, but here was Maven who won the Tough Enough, so they tried to make this guy seem like a big deal. I, I thought it was kind of dumb. And it really led to nothing because Maven didn't become a star out of it. You know, Undertaker has always found guys. Like, he always works with guys. And they just never really pan out sometimes. Like, sometimes they do pan out and they do last long in the WWE. But if you look at Undertaker's track record, with all the shitty guys that he's worked with, how many of them have actually became successful? That's what you got to think about there. But, you know, I still respect The Undertaker. I don't know why he chose Maven and why he wants to work with Maven. But I got to respect him for wanting to work with a piece of crap like Maven. Joe Juicy also asked, what would wrestling be like today if WCW was still alive? Wrestling would be much better. Because if WCW was still alive today, there would be another product out there. And Vince would not be so fucking lazy with 
doing whatever the fuck he wants to do with WWF, because, or WWE, excuse me, because, see, that's the problem with Vince, he knows there's no one out there that can touch the WWE and payroll, can't touch the WWE and production values, can't touch the WWE and ratings, he knows that, there's no other company out there that can touch the WWE in any of those, the only one that's close is TNA, and let's face it, TNA doesn't really have the greatest production values. Obviously, their payroll is not that good because AJ Styles is making more money than he would have made this year than he would have made in a whole year with TNA. And really, to be honest, when it comes to the ratings, we we have no TNA's ratings have been shit. If WCW was still around, you know, let's just think about it. The rosters would be much more deeper. We would have much more talent being featured. You know, WWE would be afraid of letting some guys go and they would actually try to make guys into stars. And instead of, you know, just building one or two guys and sticking with the Cena net and the Batista net and the Randy Orton net and the Edge nets back in the day, they might have gone to the CM Punk well, or maybe do Umaga well, or the Bobby Lashley well, or maybe even push Jeff Hardy well, because they would have pushed those guys because they would have to they would have have to because who knows maybe if John Cena he's sick and tired of the WWE WCW comes around Turner has that little checkbook and you know that checkbook is deep and he offers Cena a huge amount of deal Cena's going to take that money and leave the WWE so Vince would have to force to create newer stars for the company that that that's what would be if WCW is still around I I wish there was a company like WCW still around in wrestling because wrestling would be so much more fun to watch. Uh, Jake Loomis, and to talk about too, could you imagine like instead of just reviewing Raw on this channel every week, I had like two wrestling shows to review on Mondays? It'd be freaking awesome. Uh, Jake Loomis asks, what did you think of Chris Benoit squashing Orlando Jordan at SummerSlam 2005? Hilarious. That, that was funny too because let's put it this way. At Great American Bash 2005, Orlando Jordan beat Chris Benoit in a straight-up one-on-one match. Okay, like in a straight-up one-on-one match that I believe went like eight minutes. And then all of a sudden, here comes the big rematch, Benoit's final chance at the U.S. title. He gets like a chop and a suplex, I think, and then all of a sudden gets a cross base, and then he just taps out like that. It, it was definitely a shocking win, and I liked the segments that led afterwards on the SmackDowns, like Chris Benoit taking a piss and making coffee. And I like when Orlando Jordan got past, like I, guess, I think he got past like 32 seconds. He's like, yes, I did it. <laughs> And he tapped out. It was hilarious. That was a good time for Orlando Jordan, in my opinion. Better than him gargling semen and throwing it on, on himself on T in TNA. Ugh, fuck Orlando Jordan, TNA. Final Limits asks, what chant is more annoying? CM Punk chants or what chants? CM Punk chants for sure. Because the guy's not with the company. The what chants, eh, they can get annoying. But with CM Punk, it's like, dude's gone. Deal with it. Get over it. Stop fapping to CM Punk. Move on, people. He's gone. The what chance? Yeah, they can be funny sometimes, and they can work. And how did you ra react at Extreme Rules 2008 when HHH was fighting Orton for the title, and Orton either broke his shoulder or clavicle, and he cussed out a fan telling the fan to shut the fuck up? <laughs> that was a dangerous spot. I do not know what the fuck Triple H was thinking. Like, why, why would Triple H, if you know Randy Orton has injury history, why are you saying, hey, Randy, let's do a spot? Where I throw you over the top rope, ugh. I, why would Randy Orton even co-sign that? Why would Randy Orton be like, yeah, man, let's do it. You know, it, it, honestly, that's just stupid. That was just a dumb spot. And, and as for Orton saying that, he he was pissed off at the time. Wait, if you've ever suffered an injury, you know, st certain people have a different pain tolerance. We all know Randy Orton, even though he's my boy and I love Randy Orton, his pain tolerance is not high. And you know his temper is very, very high. So, if someone's going to rag on Randy Orton for hurting himself or getting injured, he is going to yell at you back because he's in fucking pain and he doesn't want to hear your bullshit. So, I was fine with Randy Orton telling the fan to fuck off. But, but I don't think that was the same match. What, what Didn't Randy Orton tell the fan to fuck off during the edge match when Randy Orton punched to the ground and injured his shoulder? And then afterwards, he told the fan fuck off after the, after the match. I think it was the edge match where he said fuck off to the fan. Um... I don't think it was the Triple H match. I, I, I could be mistaken. You, you could be right. But I believe it was the Edge match where he said, fuck off to the fan afterwards. Um, maybe he did it to both. Who knows? It's Randy Orton. Reed19 asks, should WWE have done more with heel or troop gimmick from 2011? Did turning him face ruin the gimmick or was bad character booking on WWE's part to blame? Uh, they should have done more with heel or truth. I, I thought they should have at least given him the title. It would have been something new and refreshing for the WWE. And especially because... He was a hot-act heel. Like, this guy actually got heel heat. 
when John Cena is getting more cheered than more cheered than you, you know you're doing doing your job right. He was also an interesting character. It, it's more of WWE's bad booking, or maybe just because our troop couldn't translate it well as a face. I don't know what Vince found what was so funny about Little Jimmy. I really don't. And I, it's kind of a shame that they dropped Little Jimmy because I found Little Jimmy kind of entertaining. Hell, I freaking made a character of him, a uh, Little Chris, back in the good old days of Chase Oliver's channel. So, in all honesty, I don't. I, I think it's more of like our troop. He couldn't really execute it well as a face as well with WWE booking the character really badly during his time as a heel. And not to mention, like I mentioned earlier, our troop did get caught caught on spice. What if WWE hired Scott Steiner as a ring announcer? How funny would his ring introductions be? <laughs> Oh, they would be the best. <laughs> From Russia, this fat piece of shit, redneck trash Rusev. Oh, God. It would just insult everyone that's like a mid-carder or a diva. And all the main eventers he would suck the dick of. Oh, that would be hilarious. I, I would love Scott Di Signer as a re re announcer. If you guys haven't seen it, go watch the... TNA episode of where the main event mafia pretty much took over. Um, you just have to watch Scott Steiner do ring introductions. It, it was hilarious. Freaking awesome. Canadian Mexico. <laughs> That's what he called Canada. He's like, from Canada, Mexico. I don't I don't like any immigrants. I can't do a good Scott Steiner to save my life, but that was so funny. Oh <laughs> Scott Steiner. Uh, I could talk about Scott Steiner all day. Uh, Pieta Neto Nilton asked, What did you think of when Randy Orton beat Christian in his first match since being drafted to SmackDown brand and took, ne took his newly won World Heavyweight title from him and being two days after he won the title? I'm not going to lie. I was pissed off at that because I felt that it was going to lead to a Randy Orton heel turn and Christian being the babyface. And, but then afterwards, it didn't because Randy Orton was still a boring babyface and Christian was this whiny bitch heel. So, that's what I thought about it. I thought it was stupid. In all honesty, I felt Christian should have had his moment in the sun. I mean, we had that awesome moment at Extreme Rules. He pulls the world title down. He's celebrating with his best friend, Edge. You know, it was supposed to be a great moment, and it got fucking ruined. Stupid WWE always ruining stuff. And what did you think of Orton versus Christian from 2011 SummerSlam? I was actually live at SummerSlam that year, and it was fucking awesome watching it live. I know a lot of people said on TV it didn't really turn out that well, but Live, it was fucking sick. But one thing I'll I'll rag about that match is how like Christian went through like fucking everything. Like Randy Orton didn't even go through a table. Like Christian got RKO through a table, so uh, pushed off to to the outside off, through a table. Like he just went through fucking everything onto the steel steps. I think Randy Orton took like only two chair shots that whole fucking match. But it was a good match live. It was definitely fun watching that match live. But on TV, I heard it didn't really turn out that well. But I, I liked it live for sure. Uh, Sharor Hora asked, Do you watch the kids' react videos from famous YouTuber Spine Bros? And when did you start watching Under the Dome? Unless that was the one of your bullshit lies since you mentioned it as your alter ego, Chase Bolivar. Um, that's actually two different two different questions there. Um, do you did I don't watch the YouTube Fine Bros, so that's just me. I don't watch that. And yes, I do watch Under the Dome. I actually watch a semi coalition with Monday Night Raw. It's kind of playing in the background. So like if there's something boring on Raw, I just turn my chair around and I watch Under the Dome. So yeah, I do watch Under the Dome. It's a really, really good show. If you don't watch Under the Dome, I don't know what y'all's problem is. It's fucking awesome. Go on your on demand. Go on Project Free TV. It is a great fucking show. Fucking mind blowing shit, man. The se season two has just been so fucking crazy, man. Like I thought season one was great, but that season two right now, phew, killing characters. I don't want to spoil anything, but they kill a lot of characters in that movie, it, uh, in that show. It's not a, a, a feel good show. Let me just say this: it's a very, very depressing show, but. It's fucking awesome. I fucking love Under the Dome. And what did you think of Undertaker's American Badass themes? I, I like the one where it's like, boom, 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 dead man walking. You've done it now. You've gone and made a big mistake. Like, that's probably my favorite. But Rollin' by Limp Biscuit and American Badass by fucking Kid Rock, that doesn't scream Undertaker to me. That just screams like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, god damn. <laughs> so, I, I liked, you know, some of his later ones, but earlier ones, eh, no, not so much. Lona Lowell asked, what did you think of Goldberg's WWE debut in Spearing the Rock? It was good. I think Rock did a terrible job spearing, um, selling the spear, but it was good. It worked. You know, it's Goldberg. It was fucking awesome. No one who saw him in WCW finally got to see him in WWE. 
and I felt he delivered very well, so I liked it. Uh, what's your favorite moment from the WWE in the year 2003? Most memorable moments that you will never, ever, ever forget. Oh, it has to be Brock Lesnar and Big Show breaking the fucking ring on SmackDown. Like, holy shit. When Brock and Big Show were going up for that superplex, I didn't expect that whatsoever. And when they hit that superplex and the referees all checking on them, and then the ring breaks, and you just hear Taz's call, holy shit, like the freaking sensors. I was just like, oh my god, I will never forget that. I remember I was just sitting there like, ah, oh, like my, my mouth was wide open as a little kid. And then the other moment I would have to remember is when Stone Cold uh, stunned John Cena at the I believe it was the first ever tribute to the troops. It was the first ever tribute to the troops um, for the WWE. You know, John Cena was out there. He was being the little rapper that he is. And Stone Cold was dressed up as Santa Claus. And Stone Cold gave him a little stunner. So it was really cool. So for anyone who says that Cena has never been stunned before, go watch that clip. One of my favorite moments. So, yeah, those would be my two favorite moments that I would, I would never, ever forget from 2003. Lino Gino asks, what did you think of when Brock Lesnar turned heel and feuded with Kurt Angle? Uh, it was okay to me. I just didn't understand really the whole dynamic of it because they were trying to make Brock Lesnar into this baby face. And then all of a sudden they tried to make this guy feel different and be humanistic, but it just never worked. And when he turned heel, it did feel like a natural fit. But it was just like kind of like Kurt Angle. It was just kind of hard to really get behind Kurt Angle as a babyface, for me at least. Because, yes, besides the whole broken neck situation, it was just kind of like, oh, you know, it's Kurt Angle. He always has a plan up in here. He might be, you know, tricking us. He might still be with the world's greatest tag team and everything. So, you know, it, it was just kind of hard to for me to buy at the time as a little kid. So I thought it was all right, but not that great. And what did you think of the Vince McMahon versus Hogan feud from 2003? It should have happened in 2004, and it should have been WrestleMania 20. That's my true thoughts on that. You should have had Vince versus Hogan in 2004 at WrestleMania 20, not WrestleMania 19, man. WrestleMania 19 was already stacked. Could you imagine Vince and Hogan at 20, where it all begins again? Oh, that would have been awesome. But I did like the feud. I, I liked the surprise from Roddy. When Roddy Piper came out during that match, oh, my God. But the feud was fine. It's not one of my favorite feuds of all time, but it was definitely worth watching. But like I said, it should have happened in 2004. Bubblegum Favorite Stories asks, What did you think of when Golda started to do the stuttering gimmick after getting shocked? Uh, not really that much. I didn't find it like as super funny as everyone else did because Bubba Ray was doing the stuttering gimmick before. And I found Bubba Ray stuttering to be really much more entertaining than Goldust, in my opinion. I mean... Goldust was only really there just to, like, be made fun of by Triple H. I, I think Triple H was, like, probably wanting that because he saw, like, The Rock used to make fun of Bubba Ray a lot for stuttering. So he's like, I want that to make fun of someone that's stuttering and shit, ugh. So, in, in my personal opinion, I, I just didn't really care about it. I, I didn't think it was Goldust's best work, if, if you really want my honest opinion on it. And what did you think of Booker T versus Triple H feud from 2003, good or bad? Bad, because Booker T did not win the fucking title. Fucking stupid. How dumb is that? You would give Booker T this great storyline. You give Booker T this moment of glory where he could win the World Heavyweight Championship at WrestleMania 19 against the tyrant god Triple H. But no, we're not going to put Booker T over. Let's, let, like, they, they freaking made you love Booker T. During this fucking feud, they went to his house. They talked about him being in jail. Triple H was being super racist with him. And being racist in the WWE standards is like, you know, say, a guy like you can't be champion. Like, he was being a dick to Booker T. Booker T should have fucking won, but he didn't. And I know a lot of people are like, well, that, that doesn't take away from the feud. Yes, it does, because the winners and losers do take away from the fucking feud. Ah, I love Triple H. Don't get me wrong, but... 2002, 2003, 2004, Triple H, I can't fucking stand. Such a fucking prick back then. Justin Side asks, what did you think of when The Rock turned heel in 2003? Rock turned heel in 2003? It was more like he was just being entertaining again. <laughs> rock, heel rock was awesome. Okay, I fucking love it. My favorite heel rock promo. Yay, we're in Toronto. That's where we live. We're from Toronto. Ah, shut up. <laughs> he was stuck into that. 
<laughs> dissing Toronto after No Way Out 2003. Strong as a book. The only thing good here in Canada because the Maple Leafs suck. <laughs> Fucking Rock was just amazing as a heel. But like I said, he was just more entertaining. Or the Rock concert. But I'll be back here in May when the Lakers beat the Kings in May. Like, <laughs> oh, I love that Rock. Like I said, Rock was just more entertaining again, more than he was a heel. And what do you think of Rock versus Austin at Mania 19 in March of 2003? <sighs> Not their best encounter, just a finisher fest in all honesty. It was all because Austin had to go to the hospital beforehand, so really that's pretty much it. Uh, Reginald D. Hup asked... Why did you create stupid trailer for your channel? I'm sick of every time I click on channel to send you questions that retarded video plays. Well, it's an unsubscribe trailer. So, Reginald D. Huff, you should subscribe to my channel so you don't see that trailer all the time. That's what happens. And I have to make it because YouTube would not shut up about me making it. If you listen to the video, you should know that. So, that's why I made it. And what did you think of Chris Benoit versus Kurt Angle matches? Great technical fucking wrestling. Oh my god, Royal Rumble 2003. That's all I gotta say. Just watch that match. Jack Trice asks, what deceased wrestlers theme songs do you still enjoy this day? Uh, Eddie Guerrero's themes, for sure. Uh, Test, believe it or not. May he rest in peace. And I like listening to Umaga's theme every once in a while. And why do people feel violated after taking a crap? I'll feel bloated after taking a crap. Uh, it depends on what you eat, though. That's how you feel bloated. I mean... If you're eating something that has like a lot of fibers and stuff like that, you probably will feel bloated after taking a crap. But it just all depends on how you eat. Like sometimes you just don't feel bloated at all. Sometimes you feel good. Um, I love watermelon five two five. Asks thoughts on Hornswoggle versus McMahon feud. <sighs> Stupid. It. It. I can see what the WWE was trying to do, especially because Hornswoggle was a. Uh, Pretty well-liked character, but it just never really transitioned well on TV. It was dumb, revealing Finlay to be the father. It just it just ultimately never ended. Like, you know, the feud never had a conclusive ending, so it was a bad feud in my opinion. And what did you think of Hulk Hogan and Shawn Michaels feud from 2005, and why did Shawn have to turn heel? I think Shawn had to turn heel because that was the only way it would work, and I fucking love that feud. That was some of Shawn's most entertaining shit. That he did. I mean, fucking A, dude. Sean with that Larry King live segment. Or the best one in Montreal. Where he's all talking about Bret Hart. And, you know, Bret, you know, and WWE at the time did not have a great relationship. And so he's like, ah, oh, Bret, I will screw you once and I will do it again. And then the fans are all booing and all of a sudden, like Bret Hart's theme is. Sean's like, what? What? And they're just like freaking out about that. Oh, fucking awesome. And then later on, the theme just keeps playing. That was a great fucking pop and Brett wasn't there. He's like, oh, you thought the hitman was going to be here. Oh, oh. And Sean's all laughing about it. Fucking awesome stuff. But Sean and Hogan feud had that. It was awesome. And I think Sean had to be healed just because Hogan, no matter who he faces, he's going to get majorly cheered. That's just the bottom line. Hogan knows how to control a crowd. I know it's HBK and everyone loved the heartbreak kid, Shawn Michaels, bitch. But when it comes down to Hulk Hogan, he knows how to control a crowd. And if you guys don't believe me, TNA Bound for Glory 2011, him versus Sting, you'll see that Hulk Hogan still gets fucking cheered to this day. This guy knows how to control a crowd. Little Fish, Q&A, do you know you look like a fucking retard in your trailer video? No, but thank you. Um, and what did you think of Razor Ramon being inducted to the Hall of Fame earlier this year in 2014? Good. I'm glad that Scott Hall cleaned up his act and he was able to make it inside of the Hall of Fame. That's all we can say about it. I'm just happy that he's getting the proper respect that he deserves. That's just my true opinion on it. Uh, Randy Busetti asked, why do people think you look like a douchebag? I don't know. I really don't. I don't get it. Maybe it's just because I have a deep voice and, you know, my hair is kind of square. So people are like, eh, this guy looks like a douche. I don't, I don't know. I, I really don't know, <laughs> in all honesty. So and it, it is what it is. And do you find Aaron Andrews attractive? Oh, uh, somewhat attractive. You know, like, I don't see how everyone, like, is in love with her. But she definitely has a nice little appeal to me. I like a girl who knows a college football, so... Yeah, she is kind of attractive, but I don't think she's, like, the hottest scene on Earth. That's for sure. Um, I prefer, you know, uh, fucking, what's her name? She does CBS. I can't remember her name right now. 
I'll, I'll have to wait once the football season comes back along to remember her name. Brony Loney asks, when you overreact in your videos, why does it look like you're just playing around and not serious unless you are playing around and not really angry about something that happened and putting on a fake act? No, I get angry about stuff when I overreact. That's the truth. I know it sounds like I'm playing around, but I'm just trying to emphasize my voice. Because, really, to be honest, there's stuff that piss me, pisses me off, and there's some stuff where I'm just like, are you fucking kidding me? And there's some stuff that pisses me off, but it's also funny at the same time. So I can understand where you think I'm playing up an act when I overreact, but I'm not. I really am not. So, just because I overreact, and you think it's playing around, I'm not. It is what it is. Some people won't take me seriously, no matter what. So, it's, it is what it is. I, I totally understand. I just don't think an entertaining video is this. Hey guys, I'm uh, here to do a video. Um, really excited to talk about, you know, WWE. So let's get started with this rock. That sounds boring to me. It just does. So I try to be as enthusiastic as possible. If you think it's playing around, Bony Loney, that's your personal preference. And when was the last time you played GTA San Andreas? Last summer. That was the last time I played GTA San Andreas. I play it every once in a while because GTA San Andreas is such a big game that it takes a long time to play. So... It's like every once in a while I have to play GTA San Andreas. Dave Lester asked Q&A thoughts on Straight Edge Savior, that little punk kid. I don't know who Straight Edge Savior is, so I have no thoughts on him. And thoughts on the Chris Phoenix and why do you think he, his webcam sucks? Chris is a good kid. I talk to Chris on an occasional basis when it comes to Skype. And why does his webcam sucks? Because he hasn't bought a new one yet. That's really all I can answer for. I don't know why his webcam sucks. He needs to get a new one for sure, though. Uh, Nintendo Fanboy1998 asked, Q&A, would you smash Vicky Guerrero? Nope. And would you rather smash Dixie Carter or Awesome Khan? Dixie Carter for fucking sure. Dixie's a MILF, man. I would smash that in a heartbeat. John Kunt asked, welcome back, John Cut. Q&A, what did you think of Chavo Guerrero heel turn by turning on Ray in 2006 and costing him the title to King Booker? Amazing and awesome because it made fucking sense. Here was Chavo Guerrero, you know, part of the Guerrero family, but he was being overshadowed by Rey Mysterio, and I thought it was awesome. Like, you you, you knew it was coming. You kind of knew it was fucking coming that when, when you saw Chavo coming out there, you're like, okay, Chavo has to be doing something in this situation, but he came out there, and he freaking grabbed the steel chair, and then when he hit Rey, I was just like, even though I saw it coming, I thought it was awesome, and it led to, you know, really, really, really great matches between him and Ray. Uh, SummerSlam 2006, you know, my favorite match on that card is him versus Chavo because it was really good. So, in all honesty, him and, Ch him and Ray just had really good chemistry, and it made sense. It's a shame that Chavo really never benefited from the feud, but it did make sense at the time. And what did you think of when Chavo made Ray say, I quit? Do your Ray impersonation. Um... I liked it because I was there live. That's my favorite live match ever. Seeing Rey Mysterio and Chavo Guerrero in an I Quit match, dude. They were just doing such sick spots. And when Rey was hanging on there, and just for this video, I decided to pull out my Rey Mysterio mask to impersonate Rey. When Rey was hanging on there on that steel, and Chavo was hitting him with that steel chair, Rey was all like, I quit. I quit. I quit. I quit. So, I liked that. I liked that match. That was the best match. And not only that, it legitimized Chavo in a way. It made Chavo look like he was a badass and that, you know, you can't mess with him and that he is a legit Guerrero. He's not Rey Mysterio. Guerreros would never say I quit. Mysterio did say I quit. Mysterio's not a Guerrero. Get that out of your fucking head. Chavo's a Guerrero and he earned that name after that match. So, it's, like I said, it's such a shame that Chavo never really gained anything out of it. You know, people say, well, the ECW title, but that's nothing. I'm not saying Chavo World Champion. I'm just saying beat your Chavo more as a legit player for you. Chavo never had the look anyways or the size to ever be considered a main event in the WWE. Now, if he was bigger, uh, it might be a different story for Chavo. Uh, and Cavillo85 will end off this Q&A. Who in WWE and TNA superstars you had, um, to you had the most memorable title wins? So far, Daniel Bryan's at the top of my list, along with Eddie Guerrero in 2004, Batista in 2005, and AJ Styles in 2009. Oh, easy. I fucking when Sean won the title um, in 96. The boyhood dream has come true. I, I thought that was an awesome one. Uh, when Macho Man won at WrestleMania 4, that was freaking awesome. Ultimate Warrior at WrestleMania 6. Austin at WrestleMania 14. Stone Cold! Stone Cold is here! Tyson knocked out Austin! Uh, ha, um, Michael, sorry, I messed up on that call. My bad. But you get the idea. Um, Mankind's is definitely fucking awesome. Especially because you had the Austin pop beforehand. It was like, 
like, you know, like the DX and the corporate ministry or whatever the fuck they were at the time. We're all just fucking bowing outside. Then all of a sudden you're like fucking the glass break. That crowd goes onto their feet. Austin comes. You see Vince and Shane's reaction. Austin whacks the rock with the steel chair and then fucking throws Foley in there. And it's just like, one, two, three. Three and it's like ah oh, McFoley did it and then Austin throws a hat at McMahon ah oh, one of my favorite moments in the WWE man one of my personal favorites when it comes down to it um so those would be some superstars from the WWE slash WWF I felt also had memorable title wins that you didn't mention uh if I want to go a little bit edgier i would also say chris benoit even though it's kind of tainted but you know chris benoit did have a memorable title win you know you know 18 year odyssey finally complete for chris benoit as jr said he finally won a world title again um when it came down to tna guys aj styles really is the only guy that comes to mind when he won the world title in my personal opinion yeah, I can't really think of any other team. Samoa, uh, Samoa Joe, I'll give Samoa Joe some credit. Even though I don't really think it was that good of a match with him and Angle because they had much better matches, I would have to give Samoa Joe a slight little edge that his win was memorable. And, and another win that's just my personal favorite, uh, Jeff Hardy as well. Because like I always remember like Triple H at the pedigree. Hardy came literally out of nowhere, Swaton bombs on both him and Edge, wins the title, and then when he wins it, he grabs like the steel chair and just fucking throws it on the ground. Fucking awesome. Jeff Hardy was crazy. But yeah, um, thank you guys very much for sending in your questions for the Q&A. Remember to keep on sending in your questions every single week onto this channel. Thank you all very much. Don't forget, guys, tomorrow I got my Destination X review and my NXT review for you guys to check out. So hope you guys enjoy that. I'll see you all next time. Peace.